All right, turn your Bible to Psalm 46. Psalm number 46. Now, before I dig into my message, I want to tell you uh, a story about how God of the impossible working in my life, okay? So about two weeks ago, I received an email from my school telling me that I took a wrong class last summer that could result in me uh, losing my status. You know, in essence, you know, I, I can be banned from entering to America for at least three years. So I was uh, very uh, struggling the last couple of weeks, and, and long story short, God answered my prayer, and you know, they even allowed me to add back the class to last summer, they even assign a completed grade to last summer, so I can, so I'm able to protect my status, and I hope to uh, stay in America forever. Amen. So uh, just thanks uh, that the God of the impossible stay in work in our lives. You know, when we look at our daily lives, when we see uh, Brother Darren, his surgery went so well, we can see the God of the impossible working in our lives. Now let's go to Psalm 46. Let's just read the whole chapter. The Bible says in Psalm 46, starting from verse number one, Psalm 46. Six, verse number one. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and, th- and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall help her, and die right early. The heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Now the verse I want to focus on is verse number 10. Be still and know that I am God. Now the title of the sermon tonight is called The God of the Impossible. And the subtitle is, Stand Still and Let God Move. The God of the Impossible, Stand Still and Let God Move. Now let me just tell you where I got this sermon idea from. So I was having a tough time in my life, and a friend of mine sent me a song, and, 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 and the name of the song is called Stand Still and Let God Move. And there are three verses in the song, so there are three points in tonight's sermon. Now first go to Job chapter 1, Job chapter 1. Number one, we see the lesson of life. The lesson of life. Verse, verse one of the song goes like this. The Father has a plan, though it's hard to see it now. You feel you are working, you are walking all alone, but He is there, no doubt. When the storm around you rages, and you are tossed to and fro, when you are faced with life's decisions, not sure which way to go, stand still and let God move. Standing still is hard to do. When you feel you have reached the end, He will make a way for you. Stand still and let God move. Now, number one, I want, to, I want to let you know the lesson of life from the book of Job. In Job chapter 1, verse number 1, the Bible says, There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and is true evil. So we see Job, the Bible describing him as imperfect and upright. He's blameless. He's complete. He's a godly man. He feared God and he is true. He abhorred evil. Now, long story short, God allows Satan to afflict Job, not because Job has sinned, but Satan, but God allows Satan, you know, to test Job. In Job chapter 1, verse 13, the Bible says in Job chapter 1, verse 13, and there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house and there came a messenger unto Job and said, um, the oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So first we saw that Job lost his servants. He lost his possession. In verse number 17, the Bible says, while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and carried them away. Yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And in verse number 18, we see that Job also lost his sons and daughters. So we see 
couple of things happened to Job. Job lost his servants. He lost his camels. In essence, lost his possessions, lost his money, the monetary possessions. And at last, Job lost his children. He lost his sons and daughters. Okay, so if this the song, when the storm of the life rages, when we, we, are, we are being tossed to and fro, when we are facing with life decisions, not sure which way to go, but let's see the response from Job in light of this great tragedy in light of losing his own children. The Bible says in Job chapter 1, verse number 20, the Bible says, Then Job arose and rent his mantles and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground, notice this, and worshipped, and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. So in light of this kind of storm of life, in light of this tragedy in life, Job's attitude was he worshipped God. Because Job realized, Job realized that when things go wrong, when bad things happen, it's not always a punishment from God. God might use that. God might use your trials in your life to be a testimony to other people. Job realized that the reason God might allow some bad things happening to our life is not always a punishment from God. Like Paul saying in 2 Corinthians, the reason we are being afflicted is that God can use us to comfort other people. Because we've been through what they've been through, right? We've been through what they've been through. Because Job realized that when bad things happen, it's not always a punishment from God. Sometimes God just wants to use you to glorify His name. God wants to use you to be a testimony to other people. But let's go to Job chapter 2. Job chapter 2, look at verse number 9. Job chapter 2, verse number 9. We saw the response from Job, but in Job chapter 2 verse number 9, we also saw the response from his wife. The Bible says in Job chapter 2 verse number 9, Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still re retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, thou, spe thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Now, I'm not trying to justify Job's wife by saying that, curse God, and, curse God and die, but I want you to realize this. Job's wife just lost the same things as Job did. Job's wife also lost children, lost money, lost everything she had. Now, I'm not saying it's right, uh, I'm not saying she's right to say that, but I just want you to realize to have some compassion on her also. Because, no, I don't think she meant that. I don't think she meant uh, just ask Job to curse God and die. The, the, the thing is, Job has a better attitude. He has a better perspective on his personal position. Because Job realized when bad things happened, Job didn't choose to run away from God. But Job instead, he ran towards God. Go to Job chapter 13. Job 13. Job 13. Because when bad things happen, maybe you've lost your children to the world. Maybe you've lost your children, they're not serving God anymore. Maybe you have gone through a terrible sickness or illness. Maybe you have to go through all the storms of life. When bad things happen, the tendency is to turn away from God. It can either draw you away from God or draw you towards God. But before you run, before you run, I want you to consider not only who you are running from, but where you are running to. I'm saying again, before you choose to run, consider not only who you are running from, but also where you are running to. Because when you are trying to run away from God for any bad things happening in your life, you are running to nowhere. Because Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the word of eternal life. Because if God is truly your Lord and Savior, if God is truly the all-knowing, omniscient, all-powerful God, then He has the power, He has the understanding, He has the answer to evil and suffering. In essence, Job realized when bad things happen, his response is to run towards God because God has all the answer. Because Job realized all he has to do is to stand still and let God move. He realized that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. In Job chapter 13, look at verse number 15. Job 13 verse 15, the Bible says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, but I will maintain mine own ways before him. Job realized that it's God that gives you the life. Even if God kills me, even if the Lord slay him, he will yet trust in him. 
It's like when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego told the king, Our God is able to deliver us, but if not, we'll still not bow down to your faith. We'll still not serve, we'll not, we'll still not serve thee. Our God is able to do that. But if God did not choose to deliver us, then he has a bigger plan. That's what the Bible says, that be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth, therefore let thy word be filled. Job realized when bad things happen, he chose to run towards God instead of running away from God. Go to Job chapter, chapter 23. Job chapter 23. Let's look at verse number 10. Job chapter 23, verse number 10. The Bible says in Job 23, verse number 10, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Because Job realized that God sometimes can work in us when we are suffering trials. He wants to purge us so we can be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. In verse number 11, the Bible says, My foot hath held his steps, his way have I kept and not declined, neither have I gone back from the command, commandment of his lips, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. You see, when bad things happen to you, when you are being so uh, consumed with the storms of life, when the storm of life rages when you're tossed to and fro, the tendency is to stay away from church, stay away from the word of God. But Job chose the other way. Job said that my foot had held his step. In verse 12, the Bible says, Neither have I back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. So in light of all these tragic things happening in Job's life, Job chose to abide in the word of God. Job chose to help. Job chose to take the strong stance upon our rock of our salvation. Because Job realized he is the God that can work miracles. He realized that he is the God of the impossible. All he has to do is to stand still and let God move. Go to Job, 20, Job 37. Job 37. The Bible says in Job 37, look at verse number 14. Job 37, verse 14. The Bible says, Job 37, verse 14. Harking unto this, O Job, notice the next two words, stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. See, when bad things happen, when the storms of life takes place in your life, when you, when you lost your children, your friends, your family, your parents, you know, maybe your relatives, just consider the wondrous works of God. Because the Bible commands us to remember the works that God has done in your life. The Bible commands us to stand still and just look how God has been in your life. How God, just one bad thing's happened, just look back on how God has blessed you throughout the way. All you have to do, all you have to do is to believe that He is the God that can work miracles. All you have to do is to, like Job, He stood still and let God work out all these things. Let's go to Job 42. Let's see the outcome of the story of Job. Job 42, the last chapter of the book of Job. The Bible says in Job 42, look at verse number 10. Job 42, verse number 10. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Verse 12, so the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. Well, he had 14,000 of sheep and, and 6,000 camels, a thousand yoke of oxen and a thousand she asses. So you see, because of Job, he, 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 he didn't choose to run away in light of all these trials. In light of the loss of his children, Job chose to run towards God. Job chose to abide in the word of God. And God, in the end, worked out everything for good. Because all Job did is just to trust in God. He believed that God has a purpose in everything. He believed that God is the God of the impossible. All he did is to stand still and let, the, and let God move. Because Job believed when things go wrong, it's not always a punishment from God. Maybe God can use that to glorify His name. God will do a work in your life, so you shall come forth as gold. I love the hymn, uh, I mean, I love the poem written by Annie Johnson Flint. Um, the poem goes like this. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, He added His mercy. 
to multiply trials his multiplied peace. When we have reached, when we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. His love has no limit, His grace has no measure, His power has no boundary known unto man. For out of His infinite riches in Jesus, He giveth and giveth and giveth again. So we see the book of Job told us a lesson of life. Even though when the storm of life rages, even though we are being tossed to and, to and fro, even if we are being faced with life's decisions, not sure which way to go, but all we have to do is to believe that He is the God of the impossible, just to stand still and let God move. Go to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. So number one, we saw the lesson of life. Number two, I want to realize the lesson of battle. The lesson of battle. In verse number two of the psalm, goes like this. When the enemy surround you and the walls are closing in, when the tide is swiftly rising and you wonder where he's been, friend, there never was a moment that his arms weren't reaching out. You can rest assured and be secure. God is moving right now. Stand still and let God move. Standing still is hard to do. When you feel you have reached the end, He will make a way for you. Stand still and let God move. In the book of Judges, we saw the lesson of battle. In Judges chapter 6, verse number 5, the Bible says in Judges chapter 6, verse 5, For they, talking about the Midianites and the Amalekites, For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came, I want to notice the next phrase, as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. So in the book of Judges chapter 6 to chapter 8, we saw the children of Israel is facing an enemy. The Bible describing the enemy are being without number. They are as grasshoppers for multitude. So how can we apply it to our life? We as Christians are also outnumbered. So it's a lesson of battle. How we can win this battle of life, how we can win this battle when we are being drastically outnumbered. Go to Judges chapter number 7. Judges chapter number 7. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says in Judges chapter 7, verse number 1, First, I want you to realize the purge of God. Judges chapter 7, verse number 1. And then Jerubel, which is Gideon, and all the people that were with him, rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the, on the north side of them, by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. I want you to realize the context. The children of Israel, they were facing an enemy that are without number, and God told Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me. Why? The Bible says, last Israel vaunt themselves against me. The word vaunt means to boast. The reason God is telling Gideon that you have too many people is, God wants you to realize that when you are fighting a battle, no, God is with you, Don't your, your own hand can save you. God has to be in the picture. So even though they are being outnumbered, God chose to perform a purge to eliminate the, the amount of, of the people of children of Israel so that they won't glorify themselves. So they will realize that God is moving in the midst of the battle. In verse number 3, the Bible says, Now therefore go to, proclaiming the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead, and there return for the people twenty and two thousand, and there remain ten thousand people. So, so God is basically saying, if you are afraid, go home. So eventually, so in the end, originally there are 32,000 people. And, and 22,000 people, they left because they were afraid. So God performed the purge. You know, the number was originally 32,000 people. And there remained 10,000 people. And that's, not even, and that's not enough. Here's verse number 2, verse number 4. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water, and I will try them for thee there. Now, Long, and long story short, after the first purge, the number decreased from 32,000 to 10,000. After the second purge, the number decreased from 10,000 to only 300 people. 
Just I just want you to, to, to picture this. The children of Israel are facing an army that's are without number, and God performed a purge. Eventually they, had, eventually, they only had 300 people to fight against an army that's without number. Let's look at verse number 9. Verse number 9. So first we saw the purge. Next I want to realize the partnership. The partnership. Judges Judge chapter 7, verse number 9. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. But if thou fear to go down, go thou with Fura thy servant down to the host, and thou shalt hear what they say. And afterward shall thine hands be strengthened to go down to the host. Then went he down with Fura his servant, unto the outside of the armed men that were in the host. Notice in verse number 10, the Bible says, But if thou fear to go down, go with Fura, right? If you're, if you're afraid, bring your servant Fura with you. And in verse number 11, we saw that, Then went he down with Fura. See, in verse number 10, the Bible says, If you are afraid, go down with Fura. And in verse number 11, Gideon went down to the battle with Fura. So that tells me Gideon was afraid. That's why he brought Fura. Now, I'm not saying it's right to be afraid because God has not given us the spirit of fear. But to be honest, we are all sometimes fearful in life because the truth, the matter of fact is we need help. We need help. Sometimes when we are facing uh, a battle, some spiritual battle in life, the tendency, the tendency is to fight everything by ourselves. The tendency is to fighting everything alone. But sometimes we need a fear in our lives. Sometimes we need to bring the armor bearer. We need to seek counsel. We need help as Christians when we are fighting spiritual battles. Sometimes we need to go to our parents, go to our God leadership in the church, you know, go to the pastor, go to some, go to some counselors. Because Gideon, even though he's a man of faith, even though he's a great character in the Bible, but Gideon was afraid. He went down with Fura because we all need someone. We all need someone to fight a battle with us. But even if we have no one, God is fighting the battle with us. So we saw that Gideon was afraid. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's right, but I'm saying this. We all feel afraid from time to time, and we all need help. Look at verse number 16. So first, we saw the purge. Second, we saw the partnership. Number three, I want you to see the plan. In Judges chapter 6, verse 16, the Bible says, And he, Gideon, divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. So the context is, is still the same. The children of Israel was fighting an enemy. That's how without number. And they only have 300 people. And Gideon instructed, uh, Gideon instructed them to carry trumpet and pitchers and lamps. Now, I don't know about you, but trumpets, pitchers, and lamps are not good for fighting battles. You know, they need sword or AR-15, some nuclear bomb or things like that, but not... Definitely not trumpet and pitchers and lamps. So, so the lesson learned is pretty simple. When God gives you a plan, even though it doesn't make sense, stick with that. Because God's way is always higher than our ways. You know, maybe principle like tithing. How can we live better with 90% and 100%? Just trust God and let God deal with that. Because when God gives you a plan, even though that doesn't make sense, just stick with that. And, the children of Israel, they stick with God's plan. And not only we saw the purge, the partnership, and the plan, we also saw the position of the army. Look at verse number 20. The Bible says in Judges chapter 7, verse 20. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lambs to, in their left hand and the trumpets in their right hands to blow with all. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they, what's the next word? And they stood, every man in his place, round about the camp, and all the hosts ran and cried and fled. In essence, they did nothing but stick with God's plan, and they stand still and watch God winning the battle. Because the children of Israel realized that all they have to do when facing an army, that's not without number, all they have to do to fight a battle is to trust that God can work miracles. All they have to do is to trust that He is the God of the impossible. All they have to do is to stand still and let God move. Now go to Second Chronicles chapter twenty. Second Chronicles chapter twenty. Now, every time I preach sermon like this, people will accuse me 
that you meant to tell me all I have to do is to stand still and do nothing and pray to God. No, that's not, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you do what, what you, we do what, what, what we can and we leave the rest to God. And some people, they want to find a job, but they, but they never apply to any job. They, they never apply for any job. They just pray to God. Some people want to get married, but they never talk to anyone. Now, what I'm saying is, you do what you can, and you leave the rest to God. Because when God gives you a plan, stick to that, and just stand still and watch God work in miracles. We should pray as though everything depended on God, and we should work as though everything depended on you. What I'm saying is, you do whatever you can, and leave the rest to God. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 17. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 17. The Bible says, Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Notice the next three words. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. See, Gideon realized that all they have to do is to set themselves. They have to stand still and just watch God winning the battle because God is fighting the battles with you. And we as Christians are fighting um, spiritual battles like all day long. You know, when we are taking a stand against the world, when we are taking a stand against abortion, against adultery, against fornication, against divorce, you know, the world is going to turn their back against you, right? The world is going to turn themselves against you when young men decide to work hard with their own hands, when young women decide to marry, build children, and guide the house. You know, the world does not like that. You know, we are fighting a spiritual fight, but why don't you stay with God's plan? Why don't you stay with what the Bible says? And the Bible says it's an abomination. That is an abomination. The Bible says it's wrong. That is wrong. There's no gray area in the Bible, okay? So we should just stick with God's plan and let God work out all the details of life. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Because Gideon realized that all he had to do is say simply obey God and believe his plan and stick with his plan, all he had to do is to stand still and let God move because he believed that God is the God of the impossible. And we as Christians, when we are fighting battles, when we are wrestling against principalities, you know, we should have God in mind because God is fighting the battle with you. But even if you are afraid, even if you are afraid, don't fight alone. Talk to someone. Talk to someone. And we need help. And sometimes we, sometimes we need a Führer, right? We need a servant. Sometimes we need to be a Führer to other people. When you feel something is in need of help, when you see people are fighting against battle, just help them. You know, if, if someone has never encouraged me, you know, I would quit church long ago, to be honest. So we all need help as Christians. In Ephesians chapter 6, look at verse number 13. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13, the Bible says, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Verse 14, Stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. So again, what's the title of the sermon? Stand still and let God move. And we as Christians just need to stand still and stick with God's plan, and just watch God working miracles in our lives. Now, I love David wrote in Psalm chapter 3. David wrote that, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there will be that say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. But thou, O Lord, art the shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of my head. David said, I would not be afraid of ten thousands of people that, that have set themselves against me round about, round about. So even if we are surrounded, even though we are fighting, drastically outnumbered, even though we are facing, we are surrounded by ten thousands of people, but God is fighting the battle with us. See, when the enemy surrounds you and the walls are closing in, when the tide is swiftly rising and you wonder where he's been, just remember, there never was a moment that his arms weren't reaching out. You can be rest assured and be secure God is moving right now. All you have to do, again, is to stand still and let God move. Go to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17. So number one, we saw the lesson of life from Job. Number two, we saw the lesson of battle from Gideon. Number three, the lesson of prayer. The lesson of prayer. In verse number three of the psalm, goes like this. 
When you feel you have reached the end, he'll make a way for you. Stand still and let God move. The answer will come, but only in his time. Stand still and let God move. Standing still is hard to do. When you feel you've reached the end, he'll make a way for you. Stand still and let God move. So let's just talk about the lesson of prayer. In in Genesis chapter 17, verse 15, the Bible says, And God God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her, and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations, a king, kings of people shall be of her. Verse 17, Then Abraham fell upon his face, and laughed, and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years of old? So we see that God made a promise to Abraham and Sarah, right? Thou shalt bear a son. But the response of Abraham is he laughed as God, God's promise. You know, how, can, how can a woman be, um, bear a child when she is 90 years old? But in verse number 19, the Bible says in verse 19, And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. So God is basically telling Abraham, you know, don't laugh. You know, when I promise, when I make a promise, I will give to you. Thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed. Okay, don't mock at God's promise. And uh, go to Genesis chapter 18, verse number 10. Genesis chapter 18, verse 10. The Bible says in Genesis 18, verse 10, the Bible says, And he, God, said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxen old, shall I have pleasure, and my Lord being old also? So we see Abraham laughed at God's promise. Sarah also laughed at God's promise, but God responded in verse number 14, Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. So God reassured that what I have spoken, I will perform. Just believe what I say. Go to chapter number 21. Chapter 21. Let's see the outcome of this event in chapter 21. Let's look at Genesis 21, verse number 1. The Bible says in Genesis 21, verse number 1, And the Lord visited Sarah, I want to notice the next four words, as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah, the next two words, as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age, notice the next two words, at the sad time of which God had spoken to him, and Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. So the problem is, the problem is when God made, you, made a promise to you, you can be sure that he is going to do what he has spoken. Because what God has said, he is able also to perform the only catches at the set time of which God has spoken to him. You see, throughout the story, we see the phrase over and over again. According to the time of life, uh, thou shalt bear unto the, at the set time, at the time appointed, according to the time of life. This phrase comes over and over again. The problem is, God will always perform which he has spoken, but only at his time. Only at his time. Go to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Because it's a matter of whether you believe in God or not, whether you, whether you have faith in God or not. The Bible has, has a lot of promises concerning prayer. The Bible says in John 14, verse 13, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. The Bible says if you ask anything, the purpose to glorify His name, He's going to give it to you. And the Bible says, and in all things, whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. You know, the problem is, sometimes we don't believe in, in, in these verses. You know, the thing is, we should not mock at the promise of God. God will perform what He has spoken indeed. You know, He is going to perform what He has said. The only catch is at a set time. We should all follow God's timeline. In Romans chapter 4, look at verse number 19. Romans 4, verse 19, the Bible says in Romans chapter 4, verse 19, And being now weak in faith, He, Abraham, considered not His own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. I want you to notice the next verse. And being fully persuaded 
that what he had promised he was able also to perform. And the story, the, the concept is still the same. When God made you a promise, when God claimed something, He's going to do that. He's going to do that, but only at the set time of which God has spoken to you. Because Abraham believed, Abraham believed, he's been persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Because Abraham believed that with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Sometimes it's hard, you know, when you're praying for something, when you want something so bad, and God tells you to wait, you know, for month after month after month. Sometimes it's hard. That's why we need encouragement, you know, daily. You know, daily is to seek the Lord, because this story gives us the lesson of prayer. God will always do what He had said, but only at His time. All we have to do, again, is just to stand still and let God move. Let's go back to Psalm 46. Psalm 46. So number one, I talk about the lesson of life in the story of Job. When the storm of life rages, when you are being tossed to and fro, not sure which way to go, Job realized that when bad things happen, it's not always a punishment from God. God might use you to glorify His name. Job chose to turn to God, and, and, and in the end, he realized that all things did work together for good. In the story of Gideon, we learn the lesson of battle. Even though when we are fighting a battle, that's, we are being outnumbered. Even though we are being drastically outnumbered. Even though we are being surrounded by the enemy, the tide is, uh, the stake is high, the tide is rising. But Gideon realized that he only needs the right position. He only needs to stick with God's plan. All they have to do is to sit still and stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Because it's God can deliver every trouble, every battle you are fighting. And number three, we saw the lesson of prayer. The answer will come, but only in His time. All we have to do, again, is to stand still and let God move. But let's go back to Psalm number 46. Look at verse number 1. Psalm 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Verse number 10. Be still and know that I am God. You see, even though the earth be removed and the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, maybe the waters raw, you know, the, the life is raging, the mountains shake with the swelling, but just be sure there's never a moment where His hand is not stretched out. And because we have to realize that God is always good to us, though my eyes can't see, hell, my heart believe, you are always only good, because it is of the Lord's mercy that we are now consumed. Because His compassion fail not. They are new every morning. Great is Thy faithfulness. I love the lyrics of the hymn, Be Still My Soul. Be still my soul, the Lord is on Thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to Thy God to order and provide. In every change, He faithful will remain. Be still my soul, Thy best, Thy heavenly friend. Through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Be still my soul. When dearest friends depart, and all is darkened in a veil of tears, then shalt thou better know his love, his heart, who comes to soothe thy sorrow and thy fears. Be still my soul, thy Jesus can repay. From his own fullness, all he takes away. Be still my soul, the hour is hasting on, when we shall be forever with the Lord, when disappointment, grief, and fear are gone. Sorrow for God, love's purest joy is restored. Be still my soul, when change and tears are past. All safe and blessed, we shall meet at last. You may ask what I'm preaching this, what I'm preaching tonight. What I'm preaching is this. All you have to do to fight against the life's battle, to fight against the trials and tribulations, to have your prayer answered is to believe that God can work miracles, no matter how impossible that is. All you have to do is to believe that He is the God of the impossible. All you have to do is to stand still and let God move. Standing still may be hard to do. When you feel you have reached the end, He will make a way for you. All you have to do is to stand still and let God move. I'm going to pray. I'm going to let our pastor take in the invitation time um, afterwards. Dear Lord, thanks so much for tonight. 
and pray that uh, we will not be shaken, uh, we will not be fearful about the storms of life. Help us just trust that you are the God of the impossible, that you can work miracles. Help us just uh, stand still and see you winning the battle for us. And strengthen our faith and help us be not fearful, but trust in you completely in every aspect of our life. And help us fight the life's battle. Help us be strong in faith and giving glory to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.